So today we have been um, presenting on the link between microcephaly and the Zika virus. He's a first time presenter, but I think he's well prepared. You can ask him like second time. Second time presenter questions. This is clarification questions and you can like challenge him a little bit. Okay. Hey everybody. Okay, so today we'll be talking about Zika and its link to microcephaly. But before we talk about Zika, I want to go back two years in time to Ebola. Back in Ebola, is, back in 2014, Ebola was all you saw in the media. Uh, headlines on CNN ran like, Ebola, the ISIS of biological agents. Bloomberg Business Week ran a front page and it was, Ebola is coming, written in blood. And Bill O'Reilly, the popular television political commentator, said that Ebola. American immigration officials should not allow anyone to enter from Western African nations because of the Ebola spread. Now, if Bill O'Reilly, any of the producers, writers, or editors had read a single scientific article about Ebola, or even the Wikipedia article, they would have known that Ebola can only be passed through bodily fluids, so semen, blood, mucus, in very, very extreme cases. So, in America, where we have good health care and clean water sources, it's not as much of a threat, but their rhetoric was not scientifically based. It was mainly fear-mongering and appealed to Americans' irrational fear of Ebola. To avoid the same thing, we need to take a closer look at Zika and what it can actually do to humans. So we'll be establishing a mechanistic link between Zika and microcephaly. So let's talk about first, what is Zika? Zika is a mosquito-borne flap virus. So those of you who did the old honors bio projects remember dengue virus, West Nile virus, and the yellow fever virus as common flap viruses. So the idea of a Zika-like virus is not uncommon. It's transmitted via the female Aedes aegypti mosquito, uh, or through sexual contact, or they found a possible link between pregnancy from mother to fetus. So basically, Zika virus can pass through the placental barrier from the mother to the fetus. However, that's not a really big deal for adults. Only one in five develop symptoms, and the symptoms are usually non-fatal, so they can be like headache, fever, rash, and Guillain-Barre syndrome in the most extreme cases, which is basically when your nervous system is attacked by your own immune system. But the big question with Zika is this microcephaly link. So there was a high correlation, or a higher rate of microcephaly which is the, which is basically the, a smaller brain size in fetuses. There was a high correlation between the number of microcephaly cases and the number of Zika cases. So, the researchers are now looking for a link to see if the Zika is causing the microcephaly. But before we get into microcephaly, let's talk about the risk of a Zika pandemic. Oh, question. Oh, um, can you go back to the? When you said one in five develop symptoms, do you mean one in five people get exposed to the virus? Yeah, so one in five people who are exposed or are infected with Zika develop symptoms. So most people who are uh, infected with Zika are asymptomatic. Okay, so the risk of a Zika pandemic. So it is true that Zika has the potential to spread worldwide. Uh, the, uh, the World Health Organization deemed it a global public health emergency and said that it required a concerted effort by international groups to stop the, stop the spread. It's expected to spread to every single North American and South American country except for Canada and Chile because the Aedes aegypti mosquito is common in every country except for those two. However, the CDC believes that widespread transmission to the United States is unlikely because Americans have access to better housing and to air conditioning, which usually decreases the amount of mosquitoes inside houses. But the big concern is the 2016 Summer Olympics. They're gonna be held in Rio de Janeiro this summer, and Brazil has been sort of the hot spot for Zika virus uh, infections. So the Rio Organizing Committee has said that because August is a time of uh, less, humid, less humidity and lower temperatures, the possibility of a global pandemic is much lower, but at the same time, we still need to be aware of what the possibilities are with the Zika pandemic if it does occur. 
So the first paper is the Zika virus is associated with microcephaly. So the researchers looked at a case study of a 25-year-old previously healthy European woman. She had been working in Natal, Brazil since December 2013, and Natal, Brazil had exhibited signs of a Zika outbreak early on. She became pregnant in February 2015, and during the course of her pregnancy, she exhibited Zika symptoms in week 13. In week 14 and 20, she went in for a checkup on her fetus, and there were no signs of any defects. Uh, week 29, defects were discovered, and in week 32, her pregnancy was terminated. Now, it's important to take note that in weeks 27 to 28, the brain usually in fetuses starts to grow rapidly. And in this case, the defects were discovered in week 29. So they did an autopsy of the fetus and they found, they took a coronal slice of the brain and they found some deformities. So if you look at the black arrows, but not the black arrowheads, these are calcifications, which are basically deposits of calcium salts that developed on the, uh, on the fetus's brain. The black asterisks are the basal ganglia, and in comparison to a normal basal ganglia, they're fully formed, but they're poorly delineated. So they kind of become mush instead of like actually formed sections of the brain. And finally, the white asterisk is where the third ventricle should be. And here you can see it's much more clearly dilated, while here it's a little bit closed off. The basic takeaway from the slide is that there are deformities in the brain, and basically that's the defect. Those are the defects that they found in the, uh, the fetus. So the next thing they did was an uh, indirect immunofluorescence of the fetal brain tissue. And uh, so the green granular color that you see indicates an intracytoplasmic reaction. So that means a reaction is going on inside of the cell, not outside. And yellow signals sit, indicate lipophosphate, uh, which is associated with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So basic takeaway from here is that something is going on inside the cells that is causing those deformities in the previous slide. The next thing that they did was electron microscopy. And the region you see here is not a cell, but it's inside the cell. It's near the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, does anybody remember what organelle is near the, uh, is on the endoplasmic reticulum? Yeah. And what do ribos what do ribosomes do? And does that make sense? Uh, why would that make sense for viruses to start popping up around the endoplasmic reticulum? Exactly. So when they did an electron microscopy, they found exactly that. They found a virus near the endoplasmic reticulum using the cellular machinery. And there were very, very high concentrations of the virus. They did a DNA sequencing and they found that it had a 99.7% identity with Zika virus strains found in Sao Paulo and French Polynesia. So they established that this virus was causing this intracytoplasmic reaction which was causing these deformities. So, any questions on that first part? You look befuddled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am on the befuddled side. Um, I think, so, I, you said that it's a causal relationship between the virus. Or, I'll rephrase it, it's an associative relationship. Yes, that was the single patient described in the case study. And uh, in the, the brain slice, um, you said, was inflammation uh, a symptom of Zika? Inflammation? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't specifically stated, but I would believe so if there are uh, headaches, fevers, and rashes. So yeah, inflammation. OK, so the second paper is Zika virus infects human cortical neural progenitors and attenuates their growth. So what they did was they took regular HN, NG, HNPCs. So HNPCs are human neural progenitor cells. So 
when you have stem cells and you want to differentiate them into neurons, there's a step in between. So stem cells don't automatically become neurons. They go from stem cells to human neural progenitor cells to neurons. So HNPCs are the intermediate step. So what they did was in vitro, they took a bunch of HNPCs and a bunch of immature neurons, which are basically recently differentiated neurons, and they introduced Zika to see infection, uh, what kind of infection was occurring and what kind of rates were occurring. So can anybody explain to me the difference between this image and this image? What are some differences that people see? Okay, so higher concentrations of green, which, uh, by the way, green is for Zika virus envelope protein. So where there's green, there's gonna be Zika. DAPI, which is in gray, just stands for cells, basically. So yeah, you're right. There's a higher concentration of Zika in this slide, or in this figure, than in this figure. Any other things that you notice? Sorry, what's the difference between the two pictures again? So this, uh, they, they used, they used uh, HNPCs, human neural progenitor cells, in vitro, and here they used immature neurons, which are like recently differentiated neurons. Sorry, no, that Yeah, I want I want you guys to focus on where the green is in relation to the gray in this picture and in this picture. From what I can see back here, it looks like the green is more concentrated around the gray in the left picture than it is on the right. Yeah. It's more of a plate together. Exactly. So you see that the green and the gray are almost intersecting. And first of all, there's higher concentration. Second of all, they're basically on top of each other. Whereas in the neurons, there is some overlap, as you can see like here and here, maybe hard to see in the back. But a lot of times it's in between the neurons, so it's not overlaying, and in certain areas there is no Zika concentration, or very little con concentration. So basically what the slide is establishing is that Zika is infecting the HNPCs, not neurons. They quantified infection efficiency by, and they did basically the same thing, and then they, uh, they did a statistical analysis to quantify what rate, at what, at what rate were the cells being infected by Zika. And they took regular stem cells, um, stem cells, HIPSCs are basically um, human-like engineered stem cells, so they took differentiated cells and put, uh, basically pushed them back into stem cells. They took two lines of HNPCs that were differentiated from different stem cells, and they took mature and immature neurons. And as you can see, the infection rate in everything but the HNPCs is much, much lower. So anybody, can anybody tell me why that makes sense? Why regular stem cells are not as affected, but neural progenitor cells are and regular neurons aren't? Why does that make sense in the context of Zika? Yeah, but let's think about who Zika affects and where it affects people. So Zika affects main, as we talked about before, Zika doesn't really affect, or it affects adult, adults, but not to the same degree. Because it affects the fetuses, which would have the HNPC cells in their brains. Yeah, so it makes sense that it wouldn't affect neurons as much as HNPCs. Now, between the link between uh, regular stem cells and HNPCs, why would it make sense that HNPCs would experience a higher infection rate than just regular stem cells? Yeah. Yeah, so as we talked about before, Zika is affecting the brain, and specifically the brain in fetuses. So it makes sense that it wouldn't just affect all stem cells because then you would see symptoms throughout the body. But it also makes sense that it doesn't affect regular neurons because it doesn't affect adults as much. Like, let's say it occurs later on, like, during teen years. What says that 
that's also not caught in line of sight. I'm not sure about when like neurons differentiate and so on, but if yeah, I, I don't know <coughs> uh, when or how neurons differentiate at different stages. So. Um, I just had a question about the graph. So the quantification of the uniform reference data? Uh, yes. Or, okay. So this was all one figure, so it was A, B, and C. But that's it. So the next thing they did was they did almost the exact same thing, except they immunostain report caspase 3 activation as well. So a lot of you may have heard of caspase 3. It's very common in the apoptosis pathway. So a lot of signaling proteins tell caspase 3 that it needs to commit cell suicide, and then caspase 3 activates a bunch of other proteins, and basically cell apoptosis occurs. So compared to the mock, which is um, basically a mock infection, so no infection occurs, they found that, yes, there's a lot, of, a lot more green here, a lot more green than here, but there's also a lot more red. And what that means is caspase 3 is being activated much more actively in cells that are infected with Zika virus and those that aren't. And then the bar graph on the side is just a quantification of that. So Zika, infection, Zika infected cells exhibited um, basically 15% of 15% caspase 3 activation, while mock cells were around 2.5%. Uh, Downregulated and upregulated genes. So they did an RNA sequencing to see what genes were upregulated and downregulated due to the infection. So these are the downregulated genes, and these are the upregulated genes. Downregulated genes were mainly associated with cell cycle progression. Well, upregulated genes were involved with transcription and regulation of cell death. So what this slide is showing us basically is that there's a link between Zika infection and the dysregulation of the cell cycle, which makes sense because HMPCs aren't differentiating interneurons. Second, they're dysregulating gene expression as shown by the whole thing together because it's changing the way uh, certain proteins and certain genes are expressed. And finally, it's increasing the amount of cell death, which would make sense because if you had lower levels of HMPCs, your brain would probably be smaller because you don't have as many neurons. So what we now know, we know that Zika infection is associated with microcephaly. It targets specifically HNPCs. It upregulates cell death, arrests the cell cycle, and dysregulates genes. And this is just a visual representation of the pathway. So the conclusion. So now that we've established a cellular target, <coughs> HNPCs, we still need to develop a molecular and protein level mechanism that still needs to be researched because viruses don't work on a cellular level. They work on a molecular level by, by affecting certain pathways within cells. So we need to understand what that pathway is before we can find ways to prevent, to treat, and to cure. The question is though, do American pharmaceutical companies have a responsibility to fund research on uh, Zika virus treatments, cures, and vaccines? because it may not be profitable for them because most countries that are affected by Zika are usually those that are underdeveloped, so people may not be as able to afford their drugs. So does it make sense for a company to produce a drug that it may not be profitable? But at the same time, if pharmaceutical companies don't produce these vaccines, these treatments, these cures to these diseases, who will? Do we have a responsibility as those who are uh, in a better developed country to aid those that are in underdeveloped countries? I'm not gonna answer the question, but I'll just let you guys to think about that. So I wanna thank the Old Journal Club team for really helping me through this presentation. Uh, I couldn't have done it with any of you, without any of you guys, so Amanda, Adam, Wesley, Kelly, Matt, Katya, Julia, Jesse, and Jake, you guys are awesome, thank you so much. Uh, to Mr. D, Dr. Korkar, Ms. Ljerpo, Mr. Grant, and Will Evenson, for really nurturing me as a scientific community member, and to my mom and my brother for really supporting me throughout my high school years and my angsty years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Questions?
two minutes. So yeah, that's one of the concerns that was raised, that because it's a small sample size of one, that, <laughs> that it may not be really indicative of the whole thing. But at the same time, uh, there, were multiple ca there were multiple cases. There was a higher correlation in Brazil beforehand. So it seems that the case study fits in with the rest of the statistical correlation that had already been established. It seems that this pregnancy was terminated like, very, very late. I'm not sure. They, they've specified that she had been living in Brazil when the pregnancy occurred, and that she flew back to, I believe it was Slovakia or Slovenia, to specifically for this study because uh, like something was going on and they wanted to make sure that the baby was either okay or they wanted to find out what was making, what was making things go wrong. So I don't know if they could get other people to do this or not. talked about when we did dengue back in Honors Bio 1, we focused a lot on how flat viruses enter cells. So it was like the phospholipid bilayer and they could find ways to have, so their envelope proteins changed conformation in, uh, in the presence of lysosomes and stuff, and they kind of like push themselves out. So I don't know how we would investigate that, but I feel like that is something to investigate. The way it escapes lysis, uh, flat viruses usually escape lysosomes. So. Lysosomes, lysosomes. Yeah. <laughs>